Okay. Okay. Uh, my name is Sunil Pai. I've been writing JavaScript for the last five years or so. This is just before Firebug came out and we were still using alerts, which we still do, and we want to satisfy clients. Uh, before I start, I want to really thank the HasGeek guys. I haven't seen it. enough people thanking them for the amount of effort they've been putting in. Put it shortly, last night when I was drinking whiskey, these guys were running around trying to make sure that today happens. So thanks a lot to HasGeek guys. Um, I call this Amplify Your Slack because I'm, I'm, I like guitars and the secret of every great guitarist lies in two things. One is the skill, you know, you get 10,000 hours of practice and you know exactly how to do what you want with a guitar. But then there's that idea of wanting to get the perfect tone out of your guitar and it, it involves an amplifier, you might have a few analog pedals, if you're electric you want to do that, maybe a little post processing. But in, in any case that becomes a stack. That's his thing. And great guitarists are identified by their particular tone. You know, if you hear Joe Satriani somewhere, you know that it's Joe Satriani. If you hear a little Metallica, you're like, that sounds like a Metallica song. You should usually write. And uh, if you hear Britney Spears, you should change your entire music collection. <laughs> uh, my point is that you, you need to get your, your tools in a row. The idea isn't to get every damn tool that you can find and put it into your front end stack. Uh, but to find those that really help you, and they satisfy a couple of conditions. They are effortless. In essence, you can drop it in and a little configuration and you get, say, a 10%, 20% increase in productivity. And it works well with teams. It's not that you're working away in isolation. You're working with a group of people. Uh, I work in Yahoo. Yahoo does some very serious JavaScript work. Douglas Crawford works there. I, I mean, he doesn't really write any code so much as Kai. It's like the Messiah. Uh, but there's a lot of serious JavaScript work that happens there and um, we try to make sure that everything is as optimized as possible by the time it reaches the browser. Or at the very least, we try to make sure that your page is showing you something before you, you know, before you're even loading scripts, we want it to be responsive and we have a whole bunch of things that we use in the process, but they all follow the basic same principles. So you're not going to see a lot of code during this talk. You're going to see suggestions. If it's something that interests you and you haven't really seen before or haven't considered putting it into your stack, please write it down. Feel free to investigate. Feel free to ask questions. But they're basically the same things. Uh, you, uh, uh, so as, as I was saying, I love setups. My setup, I have something like six tools and I like making a build in one line, just run it and I love having builds automatically done when I do a commit. I, I do all those things. I, I try to make sure that I'm as efficient as possible by the time I press it. But let's talk about you guys. Uh, bad programmers, raise their hands again. What programmers? Bad programmers. Bad JavaScript, front-end programmers. <coughs> you are too, we'll check you out later. I don't write this. Uh, fair enough. Man. Let me tell you how your career started in JavaScript. And stop me if I'm wrong. You started off by writing inline CSS and scripts. You thought that was the cat's pajamas, man. Right? You can make uh, your header change color if somebody clicks something. And that was pretty cool for a while. But it's maintenance hell. Uh, like I said, this is all my code, which you can't really see. In any case, if you can notice, um, you want to put this light on? Yeah, never mind, never mind. Uh, a whole bunch of. No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <Bad enough. laughs> very, very bad. <laughs> <laughs> just I will just wait in this way. That's okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep talking. Um, so it starts off with inline scripts and CSS. And you imagine, oh, cool, I can do stuff directly on the browser now. And it, it looks cool. I can make a little hover state thing. Yeah. I have a little menu drop down. Of course, you have to understand everybody hates those menus, so please stop doing it. But you can, you can do that. And after that, you decide to yourself. Uh, you know what? I'm going to take all my scripting and I'm going to put it in a main.js file. Fair enough? We, we all know this. An uh, index.js. But uh, my point is that this file has no structure or organization. It's, it's, it's a JSON. You say $a dot hover dot click and immediately write the handler right there. You are, you are uh, you write your handler right there, and it's endless function after function of this going on and on. And if you need to use the same function but a little differently in another place, you have to repeat the damn thing. And the moment you change the CSS selector somewhere, enter code breaks, and then you need to find out where it's coming from. This was phase two of your JavaScript career, and you figured, okay, this is not working. This is why every three months you wanted to add a feature, you had to rewrite the entire damn thing. Correct. Oh, okay. Um, so then you 
Uh, and this is what your file system ended up looking like. Where you have main.js, then you have a main 3.js. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and then there's a v4.js for the 4.js. And then you have a widgets.js that you got from the boilerplate, but you never know what to really put into it. You don't know what a widget is. This is my code, by the way. Just so we're clear. This is what I have written. I have to go through my SQL. Well, so you did that. And then you decided, you know what? Um, I'm going to try splitting it up into a few things. But in the end, then when you finally have it on your HTML, you have a string of script types with absolutely no relation to each other, no matter what. And uh, again, you have a v4.js here, you're under loading underscore here, possibly a type here thing here, load, and there's nothing telling you what happens if the script fails to load, or heck, even if it's loading performantly, if it's coming from the same place, if the protocol is right. Uh, we have all gone through this. Finally, right now, you're probably at a place where you love Backbone.js, and you're like, okay, you know what, I can write models, views, controllers, and uh, that'd be cool, I can, but then again, since you're just bouncing into MVC by saying Backbone.js, it's very lightweight and all that, you're not really separating your code. Your model code has a this.view.update link. Your view code has a this.router.go to this action. It's, that doesn't really work. You're not really having the separation. It's a lot better than that. But uh, we can make it a little better. So, yeah, my, my point is, this this sucks. This this sucks not just for you, this sucks for the people who are going to be touching your code. This sucks when something breaks at 3 in the morning and you don't know where to find it. This sucks because you have no unit. How many people write unit tests for the JavaScript here? Oh, please. One, oh, thank God. Thank you. One person. There is absolutely no reason. One is there's absolutely no reason for you not to be writing unit tests. I'll get to the topic in a while. But second, if you're not writing unit tests, there is absolutely no way to prove that your code works properly across anything without actually going and clicking and uh, your CEO finding out and he's like, hey, this isn't working, what the hell are you doing? And you're like, oh, I'm sorry, mistake, and you do another patch. No, uh, that sucks. So the point, what we want to do, though, is own the browser. We are going to stop waiting for backend guys to finish their APIs. We are going to mock our own data. In fact, we're going to use it as a reference point for other people. We are going... We are going to tell them, you know what, here is one HTML page. It's the, everyone in Django, they call it base.html. I think that's the layout file. It's the standard one. Um, my, my point is that you'll have one layout.ejs or something. And you say, okay, this is all we're going to use. We're not going to use any other templates. We are writing a JavaScript application here. Don't worry so much about anything else. This is what the backend guys get. And I will take care of the browser. I will take care of URLs. I will take care of API calls. I will write unit tests. And I will show you how it works. I will essentially make it work without you having even interface with my code. I will fake a Twitter client, I'll write it and I'll mock all the data. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to own the browser. We're going to make sure that finally when we're done with the work, it's all packaged, ready to be put onto a CDN. And we will put it on the CDN. And it'll be, it'll be it'll of course be referenced in the layout.html. Until then, the backend guys don't have to interfere. The design guys don't have to interfere. You can separate your code out into separate modules, but you can just start working the moment they say go. Oh. Move on. I'll, uh, this is my example of uh, how I try to organize my code. It might suck, but it's something I have. I'm sure uh, a lot of people don't do this until they actually see the benefit of it. People have a problem with putting stuff into different folders because they figure, oh, I got to write script tags again. That's what build systems are for. So once you get over that fear, uh, I like to separate it off into modules. A small initialization, I split it into a model and a view. It could be different, I have a generic util.js. Keep only utilities into it, stop putting jQuery, change this A color thing. I keep my templates down here, these are usually JavaScript templates. That's nice because if I'm using a code project, I can use them on both sides. I keep the libraries here, I keep my jQuery stuff here, some plugins and so on and so on. And my, my point is that you have to get to a place where if you want to work on a particular component of your code, you should know exactly where to look without without having to search through it or without having to do a file search. Fixtures. How many people, okay, not a lot of people use unit tests, but fixtures are ways to mock your data that your application is going to expect. When you're testing code, you need, my, uh, an old boss of mine used to tell me, he's like, when you're writing tests for a networking program, or if you're writing a web app or so on, if you pull out your LAN cable and you put your Wi-Fi off, at least 90% of your tests should still pass. In other words, you shouldn't be depending on outer sources of data to run your tests. Uh, so fixtures are great. 
pictures are essentially idea, it's an idea that you mock a particular response that you're going to get for a login call and when you're running your test or when you're running the app itself when you're developing it instead of having to ping a login API which the backend guy still hasn't finished it's been days uh, if, since uh, instead of that if you're going to get a response back in the format that you choose if it's going to be failed it's going to be failed if it's going to be true it's going to be true it's up to you to decide how it happens um, it's a great way to mock all your backend data and it's an incredible way to provide a reference to the backend guys there's something called has anyone seen this framework called JavaScript MVC? It's called JavaScript MVC. It's by Jupyter Consulting. They have a great jQuery plugin. And I'm good, it's awesome. All you do is dollar dot picture magic. I'll explain what the syntax is, but all you say is you, you dump what kind of data you're expecting and what URL point you're expecting. It overrides your dollar dot ajax, dollar dot get, dot dollar dot put automatically and starts serving the data that you do. Please notice zero effort. So you can still write your apps. But you don't have to put a little thing that if test mode then push this data and if this, no, no, you, you write your app the yeah, exact way you want it to be. And all you do is dollar dot ajax, you, are, if, you can do it in this format as well. You say whatever your URL is and if a fixture magic is available, it just loads that instead. You can simulate delays, you can simulate, you can throw 5,000 items if you want to performance test your JavaScript app and you think to yourself, well, that's a great idea, I wish I'd done that. Here's a, a sample, this is actually from their site itself. You make a bunch of to-dos, which uh, a random to-dos, and you define a fixture. I uh, hope you guys can see this, but it's pretty cool. You say dollar dot picture, you get request for to-dos ID, and that's still a generic. It's not even an exact URL. For that, you return to-dos, uh, the to-do that you uh, generated right now. And for every put, for example, if someone wants to update a particular thing, and you just take that and you overwrite it with whatever was sent into the thing. Now, with this file in your HTML page, it'll load your fixture data. And you're, it's not really going to be pinging Ajax, uh, uh, an Ajax endpoint, so to speak. Uh, you, are, you remove the fixture and it starts working directly on the actual URL. It actually tries to do an XHR, uh, XHR request, which is really neat. And you know where the, uh, 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 another example actually, um, this nice uh, dollar fixture also has something called a make function. Um, you guys are familiar with it. All it does is it takes a particular format that you want and it generates a CRUD template. Everyone knows what CRUD is? CRUD yeah. uh, template. So you can just use that directly. You can. So if it's going to be a GET request, it'll have, handle it in the GET way. If it handles it, a put request will be put way. You guys really have to check this out. My absolute favorite application for this is Backbone. It's fine. All, if, if you've gone through the Backbone JS, people who have worked with Backbone JS or seen it and are in. Backbone JS is this great, <coughs> Super lightweight MVC framework for JavaScript on the front end. People are trying to get it to work on the node side, that's excellent, but I'm talking specifically on the front end. There's also Spine. Uh, there are a bunch of them, but my point is every time you write code for Backbone, uh, if you've written Backbone code, you, you, you know what I'm talking about. The entire problem is unless you, it's very difficult to write testable code, especially for asynchronous code and where you're getting data from another source. But this just makes it uh, seamless. You start, as soon as you start your application, instead of writing your models and all, what you do is first define all your URL endpoints. You say $fixture get so and so and so and so. You can save it in .json files as well and $fixture actually loads it from those files as XHR request. And the backend team has a reference point. So the moment somebody breaks something, you know who to blame. Uh, you say, I had my spec here, man. It's right here and you're not sending data in the format I expected or that we had actually agreed upon. Or, you know, once you have those fixtures ready, you talk to them and you make your changes, then you get down to it. Next, you write all your unit tests for your models using this data. If, uh, if, if you guys have used something like Jasmine for testing asynchronous code, the entire deal is what it tries to do is it spies on the function, which is the handler for when an Ajax request returns. And uh, it tries to pump data into that and it assumes that it's going to work that way. That's a very dirty way to write the code test. Well, the thing is that since you've been using this to mock your data anyway, you don't really have to do spying on handlers and all anymore. You assume that the data that's coming in is fine. You don't have to send anything extra because, of course, the picture is included in the page. Speaking of which, you guys have to write unit tests, man. I, this is a problem that I face whenever I'm talking to developers. They're like, well, you know, JavaScript isn't that big a deal. It is a big deal. You have to get to a place where the browser is yours and you have to be a professional about it. <coughs> And I think the greatest analogy that I've heard of, uh, from an old colleague of mine 
you know how people say unit tests are for testing your code and it will be, they'll create little graphs for it. No, 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 not really. It's, you get fixtures and you get unit tests together and it creates a spec. It's like how the guy, I mean, you're front-end developers, you know how they give you a JPG and they say make an HTML of this. And you know you're right or wrong by looking at the JPG. The JPG in itself isn't functional, but just by looking at it as a reference, you know that your output HTML and CSS is coming out right. It is exactly like that. It's, you essentially try to make a reference point for what your code is going to be. And you keep that in the source code. The moment somebody breaks something in another module, immediately your unit test will fail. If it doesn't fail and you find the bug, write another unit test for that bug. Every single bug gets a unit test. Am I going too fast or am I, are you guys, do you guys want to object and say you're full of shit? No? <laughs> Essential form of a test is quite simple. You, you, your framework, your testing framework will give you some function called test and you pass in a function that you wanted to do something. Uh, if it's an asynchronous, uh, asynchronous test, you might want to pass in a parameter done. Mocha uh, framework uses this. I'll pass you all the links after this, by the way. Don't worry about it. Uh, but anyway, you do something and you get a value and you make sure that value is as expected. You, you're writing a little function to add two numbers. And you say add two and two and make sure that the response is four. It's really that simple. You make sure that your function does something the right way and if you pass it in wrong data then it responds in the right way again. I mean, it responds how you want it to, it throws an error or so on and so forth. So every new bug, every new feature, every new issue, every new 3 o'clock late night call from your CEO where he's like, oh, I was thinking I want to change this to do a drop down instead of a fade. Every single of those requests gets a new test. Otherwise, absolutely nobody has any reason to believe that your code works. You might say, well, look, I'm clicking on it here, here, here. And they're like, well, does it work in IE? And you're like, oh my god, I have to start up IE then, and click, 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 and it works. No. You write your unit test, and you run it out a shot. It'll, depending on the uh, size of your code base, it might last a minute, it might last 10, it doesn't matter. At the end of it, you are certain that everything that was planned is working as possible. Please write unit tests. My dad keeps saying that, measure twice, cut once. I'll measure you twice, I'll cut you once. <laughs> so, uh, here are buzzwords for unit testing frameworks. You might want to write this down. And QUnit is actually used by jQuery. They have 199% uh, code coverage with QUnit. Or they hit 100. I, I don't remember. They keep going around. Uh, anyway, jQuery uses QUnit for testing its own code. Uh, it's pretty good. Uh, Mocha and Expresso. Mocha actually works now in the browser as well. Otherwise, it's an offshoot of Expresso. It came from you know, JS JavaScript testing. Uh, JS test driver. I think I spelled, spelled that wrong. JS test driver is a module from Google. Uh, which automates all your tests. It say it will open up four browsers for you, run all the tests, make a nice little graph saying how many tests pass, how many fail, and send it to you, and do a bunch of things. It's really great. You just spend a little time making yourself a better developer by understanding what the stack could be. Uh, Yahoo, of course, uses YUI test as a module for testing, and uses Yeti or Jute, depends on which team you're on, for actually running all those tests. It runs it in the browser and so on and so forth. Jasmine is the new hotness. Uh, it's from Pivotal Labs, I think. It's really neat. Uh, it's a little verbose, but it's fine. A lot of people are moving towards Jasmine right now. It's quite strong as a library. Point is, start writing unit tests for code. Write your tests before you write your code. You will not write tests after you write your code. You do not make the HTML and then make a Photoshop look something like it. That doesn't really work. Excuse me? Yeah. What? Which of the tool is best suited to do cross-browser testing as well, not just the unit Oh, OK. Uh, so cross-browser testing, so, okay, this is a little mixture. So something like QAnit, Mo Mocha, Expresso, is used to write your unit tests, okay? And then you'd use something like JS test driver or Jute or Yeti to actually run them. Okay. It, it'll run your tests in, you, you can specify your browsers. If you look at the config options, you can actually choose which browsers. If you want to open up an Opera instance, a Firefox instance, I instance, it just runs your tests, collects the data, puts it together, and gives it to you. So, yeah. Yeah, the number one complaint, the complaint I hear against unit tests is it takes time. You have better things to do. Your better things to do is two weeks later rewriting the entire code base because you didn't uh, account for something. Your better thing to do is surfing on Reddit. Trust me, man. Uh, John Reese hangs out on Reddit. He hangs out in the episode you from the Rage comic section. He's incredibly productive. I'm sure if you write unit tests and you can prove that your code works fine, you're not going to be rewriting it later. You might be refactoring it which the unit test will save you. It will give you a reference point and it will, it will bring about unicorns. Anyway. 
Templating. How many people use templating in the day-to-day uh, -day work? Whether you're building a website or an application. Okay. Hey, that's not too bad actually. I expected worse. Uh, how many of you define your templates directly in JavaScript files? Do you compile them? Well, where do you define your templates? Separate template languages. Yeah, but like when? Like do you do you make a dot JST file and compile it? Or? I do server side in the template so they compile. Ah, okay. So anyway, so templating is uh, maybe I need to take a step a step back here. Um, if you've gone to smallish firms, ten people, fifteen people, there are usually some guys who are the back end guys, then there are the front end guys, right? And a new client shows up and he says, Well, uh, this site is going to be like Facebook and LinkedIn together, but only for uh, midgets. Whatever, uh, that's his request, right? And uh, yeah, they're midgets. They need a online space as well. Uh, so, I'm not running out of time, I need to make sure. It's just I, some... I just want to ask one thing. So, you have never, I've never used JSP. Or oh, why? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to talk about templating. Okay, I'm, not, I'm not done. I'm, I'm just sticking a step back. See, that, that's what it might do. Let me just talk. Anyway, my point is that he comes to you, right? And the designer guys are making a bunch of mocks, and that's great. Backend guys are thinking to myself, okay, we are going to make it web scale, and we're going to use MongoDB, and so on and so forth. The designer comes up to you with five JPGs login page, user page, uh, updates, feed. Whatever it is, and he's like, make make pages for us so that the backend guys can integrate it into your into their into their app. And you tell yourself, okay, fine, I can do that. You download HTML5 boilerplate. How many people HTML5 boilerplate? It's quite good, but it leads to stuff like what I'm saying. You download it and you make the login page once, and you put in dummy data. It's fine, you know. And in your updates feed, you put like ten dummy updates, and that's another page. And uh, you make another page for the user profile. And then it hits you, you have absolutely no idea how this is modularized, how this can be broken down into chunks. Instead of starting top down, what you have to do is you start, you start bottom up. Uh, you start out by asking yourself what an update is, for example. Uh, it's a Sunil Pai 8 I stream, well, it's Sunil Midget Pai, short word. Uh, he uh, ate I stream and rated it four stars. Okay, so let's say that's person, did, act, did action, and gave a rating. And you think to yourself, okay, that's actually a repeatable element. I'm pretty sure I, uh, I don't have any code. But uh, you understand the concept behind templating. The idea is that you take repeatable idea, stuff that's repeatable or you want uh, conditional constructs, but based on particular conditions and based on data, the output will be so and so. If there are 10, if there are 10 updates, then it will make 10 little, you'll run the for loop 10 times and make little developments and so on. Okay. Um, not doing a very good job of explaining this, but my point is this. You, you have frozen. I have frozen. Thank you. Uh, hey, not too bad. Um, start using templating actively before it gets to the application stage, where the backend guys are trying to uh, put it in, uh, in into their application. Uh, if you're using Node, you can use one of n um, JavaScript templating languages. You can use JST or EJS or so on. Or if you're using something like Django or ROR, try to see if you can convince the backend guys to use a platform agnostic templating language like Mustache. Uh, Mustache is good. The, the reason that I say this is because then later on when you're doing cool tricks in your browser and you want to render HTML directly, you can take the template by yourself and manipulate it by yourself. Uh, this actually, uh, when you start doing this, the point is that at some point of time, your your boss is going to come up to you and say, I don't like the format of the update. What I want is an image and just the stars. Uh, instead of changing it 10 times in that one page and not exactly sure what CSS it broke, you change it in one place in your template that you wrote to repeat 10 times. Do you see where I'm going with this? Uh, please use templating a lot stronger. Think about your HTML as a living, breathing thing, as uh, output for you know a particular request. Don't think of it as a, I made the HTML and the backend guys are going to take it and put their special tags into it and it's all going to work. That is incredibly difficult. This is your responsibility. Uh, sorry, uh, that isn't part of my slide. Uh, this is what I do, for example. I, I, I make them as JST I just can really put a slide as the contents of it. And I have a simple JavaScript uh, template loader. Very simply, it just, if 
have a small templates object and if it doesn't it exist, I do an Ajax request to pull it. And once it's put, I just compile it using underscore templates. Figure out what your solution for this is. Ask people around you. Ask me. I'm willing to talk to you about this. But my point is, stop being the guy, stop being the HTML guy, stop being that CSS guy. Be the guy who owns the browser. Uh, this is a module that I love. I've been using it so heavily. Uh, everybody here knows what push, push state, pop state is. Wow, really? And you use it on js in. Yeah. That's right. The idea is that you can change the URL in the browser without doing a refresh. Ajax was all about making a request without changing the URL. Yes. You change the URL and you can do it. In jsfood.in, it's pretty cool. You, co you, you push, for example, schedule and it slides it. You can do a pretty cool transition. And you see the URL and it says slash schedule. And you're like, whoa, I didn't see the reload happen. That's, you can do a lot of cool things this way. In essence, you have to understand that what is a URL. Uh, and I'm going to mangle this definition. But try to understand it as pointing you to a resource. When you say facebook.com slash jsfood, it's pointing you to the jsfood resource on Facebook. Now. The usual traditional way of getting yourself to that destination is a refresh or you know you load the page but now you get to define what transition happens on the way to that destination or what the experience is for a user who's moving through your site not just on one page mind you not just where it does a rollover and all that but actually you, know, you think of the entire application as a machine that you're showing in a particular way that you want you can do a bunch of buzzwordy stuff it's html5 and you can do css3 transitions and uh, a whole bunch of things. Uh, it's pretty cool though. You, you should definitely check it out. Backbone.router is the module that I recommend because it's ridiculously simple. And uh, I don't want to talk about details on it, but please, please, please check it out. Check out Backbone in general and related family of MVC flavor. Um, examples for this, example applications that have used this. My two favorite right now are 37 Signals Mobile. Oh, mobile. Uh, 37 Signals Mobile and LinkedIn Mobile. LinkedIn Mobile has done some stunning work. Yeah, with their uh, uh, with, with with their mobile website, they use asynchronous templating and a whole bunch of a whole bunch of crazy stuff. I mean, and they've got great engineers. Don't get me wrong, but it's really great to see that this is now mainstream. This isn't an experiment anymore. This is now everywhere else, and there are fallbacks for IE, and they use hashbacks. And Google won't have a problem with it. Google will actually render your page now, even if it's being generated by JavaScript. True story. Like to know. They even render SV Google renders the SVG on your page even if you are having animations. So don't worry about Google just losing just because you're using JavaScript templates and all that. I want to quickly talk about deployment. How many of you people package your scripts before they send it out to production? Awesome. So that's one. Uh, actually, two, three, four. And one of this. It's kind of hard. I, I get it, right? Because it actually takes a bit of planning in the beginning. So I'm going to walk you through it. So according to me, there are three different types of deployment. Personally to me, it could mean something else for you. There's development. It's when you're working on your laptop or on your machine. At this point of time, I don't want my scripts minified. I don't even want them concatenated. I want, it, I want them loaded one by one. So when I find a bug, I can, I can read the code that's doing that. Uh, I want my CSS also nice and big with comments. And that, that's my development stage. Performance isn't really a, a priority right then. Performance, I think that's just, I, I can't have any reliable performance measures when I'm doing it on my laptop. <laughs> Staging. Staging is everything that production is except in a very secluded sector. So while you might have minified your scripts and CSS and made your image sprites and all that, they're still on the same machine. They're not really loading it from a CDN. Um, your database is also probably on the same machine and you don't have a master slave system set up. My, my point is that staging is to see a slice of real life usage and to make sure that when you do deploy it, at least your basics are right. Production is where you go way hardcore. You might want to inline some configuration data into your HTML and your scripts get concatenated and sent as one package. You gzip it and send it. I've actually uh, talked about that later. You might want to include your CSS into your JavaScript file. It's kind of a cool trick. Uh, Point is that you have to get to a place where this is automatic for you. you there are many, many uh, uh, projects or modules that help you do this. If you have worked with Django, then you know about Django static files or Django compress. If you have used ROR, then there's something called Jamit. Uh, that's actually written by the same guy who wrote CopyScript. Uh, Jamit is pretty good. Uh, on the Node side, there are something like 40. Uh, if you go to the Node modules page, you will see a whole lot of them for building, packaging, deploying, and all that. Uh, 
See if you can spend an hour or two to download one of these based on the system of your choice and see if it will help you actually do this. Because then, that means that the backend guys don't have to worry about packaging your scripts anymore. They're already uploaded. They don't have to worry where you're referencing it from. They still are doing what they what they want to do. They're writing business logic that uh, that acts as a foundation for your app. Your thing is just a client on top of it. Uh, and that's why you need to really use it. That's why I was like, development, staging, and production is very important. I'm going to quickly start going through this. I'm four minutes. Uh, these are tips. Automate as much as you can. You are engineers. You entire deal about engineering is that you don't want to repeat yourself. You want to, you want to, you know, uh, reproduce uh, as close to what the production system is going to be on your laptop. You want to write uh, fixtures that bombard the client with 5,000 requests a second. That's a bit much. So 100 requests a second. Uh, you want to see what will happen when your when your little JS animation that you made hits TechCrunch. Again, uh, do a performance test on it. Anything. Automate your stub generators. When you're writing models and uh, views, write a little script that actually generates one file that says, you know, x dot view is equal to backbone dot view dot extend. My point is, your half the code that you write is boilerplate, and you shouldn't really be writing it again and again. That's why you download HTML5 boilerplate. It doesn't contain anything new. But it contains a bunch of good ideas set into one place and you're like, oh, it's pointing me, put your code here, put your CSS here. And that's a great idea. My point is, automate everything that you do. Automate your fixtures, your performances, your queries. A great idea and it's actually common knowledge. But run all your unit tests once you do a commit. So that the moment somebody breaks it, you know immediately somebody gets an email and woken up. Develop boldly. Once you have unit tests in your system, you will realize how freeing it is to not worry about how you're breaking anything at all. Because if you do, the moment you refresh, you'll know it. It's not going to be a hidden bug where it's, I mean, there, there will be bad bugs, of course, but bad bugs, bad bugs. Uh, there will be bugs where you will spend a night debugging them. But all the useless, stupid ones where you're like, oh, shit, I forgot to put a VAR variable and now it's global scope. And all these have to go away. You have to test your code and run JS hint on it. You want to use CoffeeScript. Doesn't matter. Develop boldly and try to push what the browser can do. Refactor slowly. When somebody says, "Well, I want this a new feature, or I want a feature to do this, or I want to use a different URL structure," you have your unit tests. Do it very smartly, though. Okay? Don't just wipe out code and then start developing for those unit tests again. That's a rewrite. Uh, there are a couple of good books to read on this, but just the Wikipedia page on refactoring software code is uh, phenomenal. And what are the books? Hmm? What books? Uh, what books on refactoring? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, these are books that I was reading when I was in the US, but let me see if I can remember. Uh, uh, there's this fellow who wrote Principles of Software Engineering, South Indian dude, uh, pronounced, uh, uh, I mean, uh, published by, by Sean O'Reilly. I'll get back to you on that. I'll put it in the list when I'm making the list. Anyway. Uh, and you will notice that as soon as you start doing all this and you start getting your system all together, you are done with the days of having 10 templates, one for users, one for, um, uh, I don't know, new customers and one to see how your database is doing. Everything becomes your code. The only thing the backend guys are doing are supplying you data, which is what they do, and you consume that data. And that's a, at the end of the day, you have a very well-tested API performing to spec. You want to write an iPhone app for it, it's ready. You have your REST API ready. You want to write an Android app for it, go for it. You want to write a desktop offline, it's great. You don't have to sit and, uh, well, we need to make a iPhone app now, so we better restify our API. And you're like, but that's going to break the old API that I built for this thing. No, you follow decent standards and your stack is complete. And these are just pieces that you drop in when you want. This is a shameless plug of my project, Sangam. This is where I actually try personally to solve all these problems. It concatenates scripts, it compresses them, uh, it's a little bit buggy, but it works just fine for a few things. A couple of cool tricks it does is uh, you can even supply it with .jst files, for example, and it compiles it and makes it a JavaScript object for you to use. Uh, you can supply it a CSS file, and it wraps it in a little JavaScript. So I have gotten to the point where in my projects, my scripts, CSS, and templates are in one file. Sometimes I want to break it up for a bunch of reasons, performance reasons, and so on and so forth. But ideally, at the end of the day, my HTML starts with one script tag, and then I continue on with the rest of whatever I want to do, which is essentially nothing, because the view, my view objects will be manipulated. Uh, have a look at it. It's kind of cool. It has no differences right now, so I do not guarantee you. Uh, but the reason I actually said this is, 
when I said that there are 40 of them on Node right now, it could be 41st. It would be great if you guys go back and write your own. It's a great way to actually learn about how systems should be built and how performance, how these things affect your performance, even on a local machine. Uh, I'm done. The question. Oh. Why is CSS and JS together? Um, why CSS and JS together? Yeah. Uh, I just want to remove one HTTP request from, and it just makes it simple for everyone else. For example, a couple of projects where I've done widget code, where you know, like, here's our widget, put two lines of JavaScript, uh, put one line of JavaScript into your page and it'll start working. When you have 100 lines JavaScript and then like, more than like CSS. It depends on that much, but I see where you're going. Uh, so, one thing is compression removes a lot of that fluff. And I'm not saying that concatenating your scripts is the absolute way to do it. In fact, in Yahoo, we don't. We don't concatenate scripts. We use uh, there's some you use modules and you use script loaders where based on definition of what the page wants, you load one module and another module and another module. So that way it actually gets a few parallel requests. But I've noticed for about four out of every five projects that I use, just compressing it all into one thing just makes the damn thing so much simpler. I don't have to worry about um, I don't have to worry about whether I've forgotten to load any assets. And if I have I don't have to go searching in HTML for it. I have a nice little configuration file where these are all defined. You know, my main.js, v4.js, and all they'll all be there. I can compress it up the same. And that's why I can actually, all, you remember the little folder structure I did? I, I define all that down in my config file. And in my development state, it actually loads all the files one after the other. But in production for me, for Sangam, I've made it so that it compresses everything. You guys might want to check out something called AMD. It's asynchronous uh, module, module definition. It's a way of defining JavaScript files as modules that can be loaded asynchronously. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's called AMD. Uh, I think people like require.js and all, require.js and uh, yep, nope.js use this. Uh, but uh, Yahoo also uses a version of this. It's slightly different. It doesn't conform to the spec. But in Yahoo, that's what you do. You say yahoo.use uh, event. And then you write a function callback that once that event module has been loaded, or if it's already loaded, just pass a reference to so and so. Questions? What, what do you think about uh, the, now web is shifting to making website with CMS rather than coding it? So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't get it. Now people use CMS instead of make, uh, just making a code or a website for mm -hmm. pure coding. Mm -hmm. So the JavaScript part of it is very poor. It's like there are a bunch of modules come, coming together and it really uh, destroys the performance part of it. So what, what is the solution for that? Well, oh, because because of CMSs you load a whole bunch of JavaScript. And there are multiple modules coming in from multiple developers. Oh, okay. So, oh. are you talking like third party JavaScript? Yeah. Like having one Facebook JavaScript on the thing, one Twitter thing, one Google Plus thing. Yeah. talking about teams. Teams and the default things that they come with. Yeah. Teams. So I guess that if you use WordPress with a bunch of, with a theme that somebody else made, yeah. the theme loads its own resources. Mm. Right, right. So what right. he's saying is that it's not your project anymore. It's a bunch of other things that you need to keep untouched because they need to be upgradable. No, so are you asking me what the solution for you? improve this? Like how, how do I improve my site performance? Uh, for one thing, you should realize that stuffing a bunch of, of um, social buttons on your page isn't going to appeal to anyone, trust me. I haven't seen one user study where, actually I've seen a couple which do make it happen, but... I'm not talking about social buttons, I'm talking about the rest of the thing, like we are stuffing up modules, and modules have their own JS. And I see a problem in the entire process where it start, started happening. If you're saying that a CMS... The way your CMS loads resources is individually and you know in a very wild west kind of way. I think you want to actually have a closer look at that instead of wondering about whether they should be allowed to load resources. A cleaner way would possibly be where your CMS, I wouldn't say build script, but the way you actually develop the CMS is your module uh, defines requirements upwards. So by the time the page actually gets loaded, you get a hopefully cached version of all those resources together. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking, but I hope that's somewhere in the general area. Do you uh, at Yahoo, we load, do you all don't try to make CMS or something? Just start making a site um, coding? Yeah, so 
Uh, of course, there's a bunch of CMSE stuff that happens in Yahoo. I mean, that's essentially how you know news.yahoo.com and yahoo.com main page works. Uh, we have frameworks which actually load. Uh, I've just joined Yahoo, by the way, so I'm not exactly sure of the exact details. But you, you you don't specify these definitions of the modules in the HTML. You have these really ugly. I wouldn't say ugly, but they serve a purpose. Where you specify the modules there. Uh, you, you specify that I'm going to have a module saying this is going to be uh, five hottest stories last week, and these are a few resources that I need to load. And when that page actually gets compiled into the HTML version, either for caching purpose or directly being sent to the client, uh, that page actually has those resources loaded properly and the modules. You know, pretty. There are all these rules that they need to follow for it to happen, but that's how they do it. Like it doesn't happen. At the point of the client attack, all the performance optimizations happen way before it's even generated. What are single page apps? What are single page apps? Um, okay, um, probably Yahoo Mail in the days of old, when it was really popular and all the cool kids were using Ajax. Um, at that point of time, they had one template where they said on the left side there's going to be possibly a sidebar. If the thing said slash inbox, then it was going to load another template which had the other thing defined and all that. When they call it a single page app, they actually mean that it's loading multiple HTML resources, if that helps, like set more pages. But single page apps are the new hotness with, I really like the word hotness. Uh, single, single page apps are the new hotness where you can, something like backbone.js, you define your views separately in JavaScript. Possibly in separate files, possibly in the same file, it doesn't matter. And you load the resources required for that particular view on the fly. There's no different HTML. As far as your HTML is concerned, it's a bunch of script and CSS tags and a body place where your job, where your JavaScript can play. It just gives you a, so that's what I was saying. At the end of the day, your backend guys shouldn't need ten templates for ten different parts of your application. That should be defined by you. And as far as you're concerned, you're just being given one canvas and you need to express yourself with that. Those are single page apps. Uh, please feel free to Google exactly that phrase, single page app backbone or single page app spine. And it's crazy the kind of stuff people are doing with it nowadays. Like essentially jsfoo.in is a single page app. Like right? it's one template. And you have little pieces developed separately, yeah? Uh, so, no, 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 no. So, it's still rendering HTML, it's doing HTML, I don't think it's easy to do. No, not necessarily. Uh, I, I barely do that now, actually. Uh, I use my HTML, oh, HTML. <laughs> sorry. Uh, the server isn't really, doesn't really need to generate HTML for you at that point. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, it doesn't, that's what I'm saying. It could be, it could be rendering it in a JSON format. It, it, it could be sending you just data. It could be saying Sunil Pai ice cream four stars. Uh, Atif Haider, Biryani, uh, two stars, he's kind of pricey that way. Uh, but it'll send you that and you have a template already loaded where you dump the data and it says, so you buy eight ice cream and gave it four stars. How awesome is that? And Atif Haider hated the biryani he ate, he gave it two stars. The point is that it's still one HTML page. The output that you, even the output that you generate for it can be on the front end. Sometimes it's on the back end. There are people who like sending HTML in the request. I'm uh, not such a big fan because it kind of Something like push page, a lot of people use it in a very different manner. Exactly, they actually get HTML back. They yeah, can something like on the GitHub page, you have PJAX. Right? Exactly, they, PJAX does that very heavily. Again, I'm not a huge fan of that, but it actually makes sense for them because otherwise the amount of JavaScript and all they would have to load is insane. Thankfully, they just get the HTML and slap it into the middle of the page. It works for them, it works very well for them. Uh, there could be a scenario where there are too many views and uh, what, what would happen here? Uh, would all the resources be loaded at one go? Ah, one see that's really yes. okay, so that is your fifth out of four. Uh, four out of five cases you don't really, that doesn't really happen where it yeah. loads uh, an MD of JavaScript. That doesn't really happen. But once you do get that, then you want to see into loading modules on demand. Where you might have a definition which says, you know, uh, back uh, x dot hundredth view dot load and once you say load it loads the entire definition for that file and the resources that it needs perhaps even CSS and a few images that you want to keep cached. So that's where you start adopting those strategies. You just check out AMD JavaScript, require JS, you have no JS, that's all. Am I out of time? I'm out of time. Uh, thanks a lot guys. Uh, don't forget to thank the Hasgeek guys, they have been freaking awesome. And um, 
Tschüss.